on Thursday. <laughs> All right, so we'll talk about the exam at the end. <laughs> that was a good interlude, eh? <laughs> so last day, when we were talking about the preservation of foods, we've talked mainly about using thermal energy to inactivate microorganisms. So by heating to high temperatures for very short periods of time, we can rely on the fact that every microorganism, every nutrient has a D value and a Z value. And depending on those parameters, that determines how long and what, to what temperature we have to process that food for. This works when we don't worry too much about the quality of the nutrients in that product because heat degrades nutrients, all nutrients. Different nutrients are more susceptible to damage by heat than others. It also depends on whether or not that food can support the chemical changes that happen associated with cooking. Things like caramelization and pasteurized juice, not desirable. So when you talk about orange juice that's been pasteurized, you don't want caramelization. Maillard reaction. So if you're talking about a can <coughs> of baked beans, it doesn't matter if it develops a cooked flavor. That's seen as a positive attribute to that product. If you're buying a can of baked beans in a maple syrup sauce, chances are you don't really care about the phytochemicals that are associated with that bean. So if 20% of those nutrients are degraded, that's usually, a, that's usually an okay consequence since you want that cooked associated flavor with the beans. But there's products, things like chicken broth, milk, orange juice, that we want to deactivate the enzymes, but the associated heat that comes with pasteurization changes the organoleptic properties or the nutritional properties to a point where we don't want or it's no longer desirable to be served. So how then do we get around processing and making a safe product without using that traditional in-can packaging? So when we talk about that in-can packaging, a can of Diet Coke or a can of soup, there's a certain dimension of that can and that heat has to penetrate through that can, right? Just like when you take a turkey out of the freezer, that surface begins to thaw immediately, but it takes a long time for that core of that turkey to thaw. Same thing when you're cooking it. You put that turkey into an oven, the skin of that turkey or the surface of that cooked turkey is over-processed, right? You see a lot of Maillard reaction, a lot happening on the surface. It becomes crispy, it dehydrates. That core is minimally processed. So we've got to get that to a minimum temperature to ensure that we've killed any pathogenic or spoilage microorganisms associated with it. The surface of it, we have had a far greater thermal process done to it. So one of the things that we try to do in the food industry when we, when we need to, is to take that food out of the packaging. This is especially true when we talk about liquids, things like milk, chicken broth, broth, beef broth. And we use what's called aseptic packaging. And aseptic packaging or processing, what that means is we take that food product that's unsterile and we commercially sterilize it or pasteurize it by putting it through a piece of stainless steel equipment that has very, very thin configurations. Why? Because if you have a thin configuration of liquid, it very quickly heats up. There's not a large temperature gradient within that one or two millimeter gap. So when that surface gets hot, the core of that material also gets hot. So we can minimize the over-processing of the parts of the food and we can minimally process that entire food. Now the challenge to this is once you've sterilized that food product, so you've taken that milk or that orange juice, you put it through the pasteurizer, you now have to make sure that from the time it leaves the pasteurization equipment to the time that package is sealed, it remains in an isolated aseptic environment. So any equipment that moves that fluid product from the pasteurization equipment to the filling equipment must be sterilized. If there's bacteria there, it will recontaminate the product and will get spoilage or pathogenesis depending on what the microorganism is that contaminates that product. On top of that, the packaging material also has to be sterilized because if there's microbes already on the inside of that material package, when you fill the food, seal it, it is then already contaminated. So it presents a lot more challenges 
to actually physically do. We have to make sure the environment is sterile, that the process is sufficient to kill the microorganisms that was present in that food product, that the packaging is sterile, and that that package is sealed in a sterile environment. Now, depending on the configuration or the type of food that we're doing, the way in which we undergo aseptic packaging differs. So the most common of the heat exchangers is the plate heat exchanger. This thing, this thing looks so cool and I love the dot that was on it, but the connectivity sucks. Yeah. And I just charged it. It's not that. It's done. I have to get a new one. So the plate heat exchanger is the most common. The plate heat exchanger, you can imagine, is a, a very thin, grooved piece of stainless steel. And then you have another one. And there's a rubber gasket in between that. And that rubber gasket is about a millimeter thick. So milk is able to travel through that between those two plates. Then between the next two plates, you'll have a gap where there's hot water or steam going through. And then another gap where there's milk, another gap where there's stainless steel, another gap where there's milk, another gap where there's stainless steel. So you stack all these plates together and you let the fluid flow through and on the opposite sides of the stainless steel you have your heating medium. So this is what we call indirect heating. When the steam does not come into contact with the food. Now this is important because this uses a, this uses a low quality, very inexpensive type of steam to form. So this is true for what we call the plate heat exchanger, the tubular. So all that is is a tube with an outer tube. Typically the food goes through the middle, this heat is on the outside, and then the heat is transferred through that surface area. When we talk about contact type, that means that the steam comes into contact with the food. So typically we have a jet, we have a fluid, the fluid is flowing through and steam is being bubbled into that food. Now when we do that, we have to be cognizant of the fact that that steam, or part of that steam, is going to condense within that food. So it's going to change the water activity, right? Because water is going to condense, it's going to increase the water content, water content goes up, water activity goes up. So we have to be prepared to either allow for that dilution to happen, which typically we don't want. So what we do then is after that food leaves, the non-contact heat exchanger, it goes into a vacuum. Now why would it go into a vacuum? What's the point of pulling a vacuum on something that is hot? Anyone know? Right. So there's enough latent heat in that food that if you drop the pressure enough, the boiling point will drop below the temperature of that food and you can control how much water then you pull back out of the system. Now what's important to note is the water that's condensed from the steam is not the same water that's evaporated out of the food. <laughs> it's the same quantity, but we have to then worry about the quality of the steam. And this is what we refer to as culinary steam, which is extremely, extremely important because we want to ensure that the product is consistent. So again, when we talk about a plate heat exchanger, you can see those grooves. What would be the advantage of flowing a liquid through a set of channels that change directions? What that does is it induces turbulence into that medium. Why do you want turbulence? Because you don't want that same fluid to be exposed to that surface the whole time. You want it to be on the part of the time at the surface, part of the time in the middle. So this accelerates the heating by inducing convection. Convection allows that acceleration, but it also the acceleration of heating, but it also allows for that other liquid to not be overprocessed at the surface of that material at the surface of the heat exchanger. Now, every configuration has a specific limitation. In the case of plate heat exchangers, you, because the gaps are so narrow, you can only do low viscosity food products. The other thing that you can do is because it's only about a millimeter wide, you can have no particulate. So when we talk about plate heat exchangers, this is typically what we use in the dairy industry. So if you have a small farm and you're making ice cream, you're going to have a, plate heat a small plate heat exchanger that's able to allow that milk to flow through, the steam to flow through the other way, and allow that to heat. 
The other advantage of taking the food out of the material, out of the can or out of the packaging is we can recapture that energy. So we can recycle the energy. So when the hot fluid, let me see if this works, hopefully it does, yes. Okay, so we have our milk. So here we would have a holding tank. Typically we homogenize the milk so we have a consistent product. We can separate it depending on what we want to do. And then the milk comes in and that milk at that point is cold, right? What temperature do we store milk on the farm? Three to four degrees Celsius, right. So that milk is cold. So that milk comes into the heat exchanger and the first thing it's exposed to is the hot milk that's been pasteurized. So we have a plate, a stainless steel plate. On one side we have raw milk that's cold. On the other side we have freshly pasteurized milk. So we're using that freshly pasteurized milk to heat up that cold milk coming in. So we're actually recycling or reusing a part of that energy. The two biggest costs in the food industry are infrastructure and energy. Energy typically in the form of steam. So whatever we can do to minimize the amount of steam we require is a cost savings for your process. So when that hot milk is exposed to the cold milk, the cold milk then Ah. The cold milk then goes into the second stage of the heat exchanger, which is then exposed to steam. This then brings that milk from, let's say, 40 or 50 degrees Celsius up to 62 or 72, whatever the processing temperature is. So this allows you then to finish off that heating cycle. The milk then that's been pasteurized goes back into the regeneration section and heats that cold milk coming in. So it drops the temperature of that pasteurized milk. This then allows us to use less cooling material to cool that milk. So this allows us to save a lot of energy across that processing spectrum. We get an increase quality of the product because we see less nutrient degradation, because we see less fouling, but there's limitations to the, type of the types of food that we can process. So in the case of this, low viscosity, non-particulate food. Now, irrespective of the technique we use, it doesn't matter what method we use as a thermal medium, there will always be a loss in product quality. So whenever you apply heat, you will lose nutrients. You cannot avoid it. Because it forms what we call free radicals. And then they become very, very re reactive. So the food industry is always looking for and investigating new ways to process foods without applying heat. Or by applying heat more uniformly. So one of the biggest technologies right now that is getting investigated and that's being implemented is non-uniform, or sorry, is uniform heating. So think about your microwave dinner. You take your microwave dinner, you stick it in your microwave, you put it on for 30 seconds, you pull it out of the microwave, and in theory, it should have heated uniformly. Now, if you put something like a hamburger patty in there, it will heat fairly uniform, meaning the surface temperature is going to be very, very close to the internal temperature of that hamburger patty. But when does this start to fall apart? When does, you, when does heating no longer become uniform in a microwave? Does anyone know? Yeah. You're getting there, so you, yeah. So, so spherical is different than, so spherical has some really weird phenomenon. If you're ever bored and have some time to clean up, put an egg in an eggshell in your microwave and see what, see what happens. Because of the convex sur surface, it actually focuses the radiation and actually creates hot spots and your egg will create really cool explosions. But you have to be willing to clean up your microwave. Yeah. Yeah. 
Exactly. So depending on the composition of the food, and if that composition of the food is not uniform, think about a TV dinner. You take your TV dinner, it's, let's say you're having a Thanksgiving TV dinner all by yourself while you're studying for the midterm. That TV dinner is going to heat at different rates depending on what is in or how that food interacts with that microwave radiation. So what does that mean? So a microwave, all it is is a transducer which creates basically something like a radio wave. So just like any other light, it's got a wavelength and an amplitude associated with it. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy. So microwaves come in two different frequencies, the most common of those being 2450 megahertz. Now because of that frequency, we know or we can calculate the length, the wavelength of that light. So you can imagine the light is coming across and it's going up and down, up and down, right? Everyone knows that light is a wave, not a particle, right? And as that electromagnetic Radiation, so I'm trying to do it towards you, and uh, man, that's terrible. So we got up and down, and forward and back. So we've got the electrospectrum and the magnetic spectrum. So as we do that, as we have this, we're creating a magnetic moment that changes. So the magnetic moment points up, and then the magnetic moment points down. So any molecule that has a dipole moment associated with it will try to align itself with that magnetic radi with that electromagnetic radiation. So what does that mean? Your wavelength goes up and down. If you have a molecule that has a charge that's asymmetric, so it goes up, it aligns, it drops down, it aligns. It goes up, it aligns, it goes down, it aligns. This rotation is thermal energy, right? Thermal energy, vibrational, rotational, translational, so all we're doing is putting thermal energy into that molecule. That molecule rotating, so any molecule that has a dipole moment will rotate with the electromagnetic spectrum of the microwave. What does that do? That creates friction, that causes its surroundings to heat up. So what molecules align well with a dipole moment? Yeah. Water. What else? But there's one more big one. What's another molecule that has a really strong dipole? So we've got hydrogen bonding, which is partially the dipole moment, and we have what other type of non-covalent interaction? Starts with an I. Ionic, salts. So if you have a region of your food, let's say a sauce that's a water-based sauce with a lot of salt, that is going to heat up much, much faster than a fat. Because a fat has that aliphatic chain, doesn't have a dipole moment, doesn't rotate, doesn't align. So that fat sauce takes a long time to heat up in a microwave. That water-based system takes a very short period of time. So again, there's limitations to how we design the food that will allow us whether or not microwave radiation is a suitable alternative to conventional thermal processing. The idea of this, though, is that it happens at a much much faster rate. We can heat up that food to the temperature in a shorter amount of time. So the advantage, yeah? Can you comment on why there's so much controversy over the safety of microwaves? So it, from what I understand, like, there's a lot of different arguments for safety of um, electromagnetic radiation. So electromagnetic radiation can pass through the human body and cre can create ionizing effects, which can become a carcinogen. The other thing that happened years ago, and it's a bit of a folklore, I think, is they used to take the doors off of microwaves to allow them to accelerate, and people were cooking their insides, they were saying. I don't think that's true. There is nothing different that's produced by microwave radiation than there is by thermal processing. So the risks are less in microwave because the, ther the, the heating time is shorter. So there is no risk to using microwaves in foods. We'll talk about gamma radiation in a minute, which is a little bit of a different story. So the advantage, rapid heating times. So your cook hold time becomes shorter. Because you have a less, because it takes less time to heat up, means it takes less for it to be less time to be processed. Less processing time means that we have more nutrient preservation. So our product quality 
can go up. In ideal conditions, we can have uniform heating. We're never going to have uniform heating in a multi-component TV dinner on those big, what are they, big turkey dinner type things. We'll never get uniform heating. But on a meatloaf, on a brick of meatloaf, you could have very uniform heating there because it's a fairly homogeneous food. You can also use microwaves to absorb differently. So you can have preferential heating. So you can design packaging to be insulative to the microwave radiation or that can, can, that can focus that radiation. So you can actually get non-preferential heating by designing packaging. But again, this still creates thermolytic products, meaning that there's still breakdown products associated with the use of microwave radiation. The difference being the heating time is decreased. The decreased heating time means we have some preservation of micronutrients, some, some beneficial gains in micronutrient preservation of microwave radiation versus conventional heat transfer. But again, it's still not great. So then the idea is, how can we kill microorganisms without changing the temperature of that food? Because we know that micronutrients are sensitive to temperature. So how do we do that? We can do that by using ionizing radiation or basically gamma irradiation. Now, in gamma irradiation, the, these require very, very complex facilities. Why? Because we cannot turn off an irradiation source. So when you have a radioactive compound, cobalt 59, let's say, or cesium 137, those cannot be turned off. They're always releasing gamma irradiation. So in a processing plant, you have to have a lot of safety features that protect the workers from that source of irradiation. Meaning, you can't take a big vat of apples or spices and walk them into the core of that irradiation facility. You would generate cancer extremely quickly. So how we typically build these systems is we have a tunnel with a conveyor belt that goes through a series of 90 degrees turns. Why? Because 90 degrees, you can't reflect energy, you can't reflect light around a 90 degree bend. So if you put three of those in place, no energy is going to escape. And we build like six foot deep concrete walls. Again, a radiation has a certain distance. It can travel through concrete. About six feet is a good insulated barrier. You could also use lead, a thin sheet of lead, but it's cheaper to pour a few feet of concrete. The food then travels around the irradiation source for the given amount of time that it's needed to induce the sterilization. So just like thermal processing, every microorganism responds differently to the length of time that is required to be exposed to that dose or that amount of irradiation to sterilize that product. So just like thermal processing, every microorganism responds to that ionizing radiation differently. When that food leaves the irradiator or has undergone irradiation, the temperature change of that food is insignificant. It's a few degrees Celsius. So you can create a cold, sterile product. So a lot of times you will hear irradiation referred to as cold pasteurization. The question becomes, do micronutrients break down in the presence of irradiative energy? or gamma radiation? The answer is it does. And depending on the micronutrient, you may be better off to use thermal processing, but in other instances, you may be better off to use irradiation. And you can see that different nutrients, so we've got thiamine, you've got your antioxidant, alpha tocopherol, vitamin E, retinol, another antioxidant. These are highly sensitive to irradiation. But you've got other micronutrients, your K's, your B vitamins, folic acid, these are less sensitive. So if you have a food that's high in B vitamin, the idea of pasteurizing it with heat is not a good idea. You'll lose about 30% of that nutrient during processing. Here you will lose less micronutrients, anywhere between, between 10 and 20%. So you can get about a 10% savings over traditional thermal processing. The other thing it does is it doesn't give off flavors. 
So when we talk about caramelization reaction and Maillard reaction, that requires heat to, for those reactions to progress. This is cold temperatures. So this can be done at 5 degrees Celsius, 20 degrees Celsius. Very rarely does this get coupled with high thermal temperatures. So to preserve nutrient quality, we can cold pasteurize that material to try to preserve the quality. Now, there's a lot of disadvantages. The most common one that you hear talked about is that your food becomes radioactive. Your food does not in any way, in any form, become radioactive. If you allow that food to sit long enough in an irradiation or in a gamma irradiation source, by the time it became radioactive, it would be so inedible that you wouldn't even consider picking it up, let alone putting it in your mouth. It'll dry out, it would desiccate, there would be so many off flavors associated with it. So the idea that, if, that this compound, that this food, can then can become radioactive, that can then affect health, is ludicrous. Yeah? I have a So these facilities, what they do is they have a fail safe. So if something gets stuck or there has to be maintenance inside, the irradiation source drops into a 20 foot pool of water. And that then will allow that the worker to go in and work. But in terms of like the, the vitamins themselves, you're just saying that they break down like what other nutrients would they break down to or what compounds? Well they don't break down into nutrients. So this, it's a great question. So in thermolytic products, there's a couple things that can happen. First, the first thing that happens is the formation of a free radical. We're gonna talk about this a lot after the exam. And this formation of this free radical is really, really important. This is why smoking is so bad for you, is because you get all these free radicals. And free radicals are extremely reactive species. So in a food, what'll happen is you get a free radical form, they then interact with the lipid, that lipid then forms a free radical, which then undergoes oxidation, and then there's a whole bunch of things that can happen. One is that you can just lose the double bond, and it becomes a saturated fat. But the other thing that can happen is it can split down into a short chain alkane, right? And a short chain fatty acid. And then you can break it down into alcohols and ketones. And we'll talk all about this in lipid chemistry. So you can produce all these off flavors. But the changes can also be very, very minor. And in the case of a micronutrient, the gain or loss of a double bond or a shift in position of a double bond is enough to, do, to, to take away that biological activity of that vitamin or micronutrient. So it can be that that molecule splits up into a whole bunch of small molecules, and those small molecules can become carcinogenic. Typically, they're very pungent flavors. This is why fish gets that smelly odor, is because of oxidation and because of lipolysis. So all of the breakdown products are very volatile, are very unpleasant aromas, but the key is, even minor changes, again, a shift in a carbon, a change in the hydroxyl position, a change in a double bond position, is enough to change the biological activity of that micronutrient. So again, and it leads to another great point. So when we talk about heating fats and oils, we don't want to take a polyunsaturated oil, so something like rapeseed oil or sunflower or safflower or grape oil and then fry with it. Why? Because you're gonna produce carcinogens. So if you're at home and you're making a batch of french fries and you pour in your liquid oil, you are slowly killing yourself. You really are. You are producing so many carcinogens in heating that oil up that it becomes toxic. You'll hear about this all the time when you talk about fast food chains, you can tell, and we'll talk about this next week, when a fast food chain changes its oil based on the smells that you walk into. I know instantly when I pull up to a McDonald's and to a Burger King, if that oil is old and is dangerous to be consumed by the smell outside of that store. And we'll talk about how that happens when we do lipid chemistry. The thing that sucks, yes. <laughs> saturated fats. Saturated fats don't undergo oxidation. So lard, tallow, um, 
fully hydrogenated canola oil. Things that you don't think as heart healthy oils. And, and this is a real problem in the food industry, is what do we do? Right now, everyone's against trans fats. We know everyone's against trans fats. It's well understood that trans fats are bad for us. Trans fats are excellent frying oils. So up until last year, well a couple months ago, every fast food chain would try to develop the best blend of fats to replace the trans fats that they were using in frying oils. It doesn't oxidize trans fats as readily, but saturated fats don't undergo oxidation. Having said that, even though we don't produce heat in this reaction, we still produce ions. We still produce free radicals. Those free radicals, by their very nature, by that unpaired electron, are reactive. So when you consume them, what is your body, or how do you try to deal with them? How does your body get rid of free radicals? All nutrition people should have their hands up. Yeah. Antioxidants. Antioxidants. So we eat vitamin C, we eat resveratrol, because it's going to keep inflammation down because oxidation is low. Well, kind of. When we talk about most antioxidants, the biological availability of those is extremely low, meaning they don't get into your bloodstream. And if they did, they would literally kill you. Polyphenols, what do they do? They coagulate proteins. What's in your blood? Protein. Put a whole bunch of polyphenols in there, you'll be on the floor with a stroke. So it's a good thing that we can't absorb polyphenols that well. They do aid in the sequestering of free radicals. Vitamin E is a really important one. What's your body's natural system to sequester free radicals? First year biology. If your high school teachers didn't talk about this, they did something very wrong for you. What is it? How does your body deal with free radicals? So antioxidants is a very small part of the solution, but it's the one the food industry and the nutritional industry are all over right now. How, do you, how does your body move electrons around? What two molecules? Um, FADH. Okay, what three molecules? NADH. NAD, NADPH, yeah. The other one's the more obvious one. No? ATP, ADP. Those are your natural electron sinks. How do you get a lot of ATP in your body? Eat a lot of food that contains a lot of? Energy, which could be carbohydrates, carbohydrates which is? <laughs> We're getting there. Glucose. Glucose, thank you. Glucose is the entry point to the electron transport chain. So glucose is the way your body deals with free radicals. Don't eat glucose. Say hello to cancer. Because you're not going to have the ATP and the NADPH to sequester free radicals. It's again, all about balance, right? You can say, I'm going to cut out all the sugar but I'm going to go eat six glasses of red wine to get resveratrol to sequester the free radicals in my body. Well, not really. It's going to be a pretty bad end for you pretty quick. So these free radicals are the whole theory of aging. Yeah? I, like, I hear a lot of people say that uh, like carbs cause cancer. Overconsumption? Yeah. Because now we're starting to play with your hormones. We're starting to play with insulin levels. So it's all about a balance. You can't, you, you, we can no longer dissect our food and talk about it as individual components. It's, it, we're so far beyond that now in science that we know that everything has to be perfectly proportioned. And if we don't eat a proportioned diet, if we don't eat too much fiber, or we don't eat enough red vegetables, we know we're going to have deficiencies. In most of the population, depending on what that deficiency is, we'll never notice it. But when you're talking about people that are trying to be super cognitive, or that are working to be like marathon runners and weight trainers, very small imbalances can start to create a lot of problems. Small imbalances of B12 now have been showing to be a leading cause of dementia, right? So we have to understand how these molecules are affected by processing, but also how does that then affect how we select foods? Because depending on your socioeconomic status and where you live, and we'll talk about this a little bit, and Evan Frazier talked about it a little bit from a global perspective, but depending on where you live in Canada, 
depending on where you live in the GTA, your exposure to foods differs. Imagine yourself, a single mother, let's say you're a university student who doesn't own a car. Your circle of radius becomes very limited, especially when you talk about grocery shopping. So you have to take your kid, and if, once you have kids you'll realize just that in itself is so much work. So you take this toddler, you pack him up, you get him ready to go, you come home and you have to carry home your groceries. If you don't have enough money, if you're at a socioeconomic status where you have to rely on public transportation, your circle of radius is about five kilometers. There are what we call food swamps. Did, did Evan talk much about food swamps in food security? So a food swamp is in places like Saskatoon, in per specific areas of Toronto. Areas you can't quite find a grocery store, but you can find 25 fast food stores and six max convenience stores. You can buy an apple or a banana at max convenience, but you're going to pay two or three dollars for it. You can't find a Whole Foods, a Zayers, a Loblaws. You can't find a Food Basics or a No Frills. You have to take a taxi to that. And if your socioeconomic status does not allow that, and you have to rely on feeding your child from McDonald's, from max convenience stores, so boxed, packaged foods, you are predisposed to an unhealthy lifestyle simply because of where you live and the salary you are earned, irrespective of your education. There's just nothing you can do about it. So global food security comes right down to within our own region, our own backyard. And to think that we're not affected in a similar way as a developing nation, we are. You, if you go to any major metropolitan city, go to the bad areas of the town and look at how many grocery stores are there. Try to find one. You end up in a zip code that's where people are making $100,000 a year. Zares doesn't want to put a, a convenience store where the mean income is $21,000 and they have to support a household on $21,000. That's not their demographic. That's not their market. That's max convenience stores. That's McDonald's. That's Subway. It's Loblaws. Sorry, not Loblaws. It's the fast food chains. And they pry. They go to these areas because they know that that's where people will spend money. They know that if they come into these areas that you can't have a Burger King on every corner because you know the consequences of eating Burger King every day. So, back to irradiation. So the key thing is that energy cannot be turned off. It is always emitting gamma irradiation and as a product of that emission of gamma radiation we end up generating free radicals in that product which are just as bad as the thermal free radicals generated but it does not produce the associated off flavors with the food. But there is no risk, zero risk, on that food becoming radioactive. The thermolytic and irradiated products are equally detrimental. So a radical formed from irradiation is no different than a radical formed from thermal processing. So your risks associated with those two things are the exact same. Now, how does irradiation work? Irradiation works by knocking hydrogen off of molecules and creating free radicals. So when that happens to DNA, or a protein, or an enzyme, it changes the configuration of that molecule. If DNA is damaged, it can't be replicated. That'll cause cell death. It cannot transcribe proteins, which means that enzymes can't get produced, which will cause cell death. It will cause ions to form in the aqueous phase around it, which become, which become reactive and can then interact with a DNA or a protein in that molecule and make it inactive. So it's the indirect effects that are important when we talk about sterilization. So those waters become ions, those ions then become interactive with different solutes in that, of the cytoplasm of the micronutri- of the of the microorganism, that then will kill the microorganism. There's just enough free radicals that are formed that then cause so much damage to the DNA of that molecule or that, of that insect or of that bacteria that it dies. Now, the death is dependent on the size of the molecule. So think about a radiation as a laser beam. The bigger the molecule, the more likely you are to hit it with the laser beam. Right? So the bigger the DNA, 
the more susceptible it is. So where irradiation really gets a lot of utility and it's a very, very important technology is in developing countries to sterilize large amounts of grains from infestation of insects. So if you have an insect infestation, you can get the insects out, that's not the de big deal, but they consume a lot of the food. So by killing them, you get a higher yield of your crop value. It also allows that microbial damage before that food becomes unpalatable. So we can kill the bacteria well before there's significant damage to the micronutrients. The downfall to irradiation is that viruses are very insensitive to irradiation because their DNA size is so small. Having said that, heat, we have to go to very high temperatures to kill viruses with heat. So it's the same limitation as we have with thermal processing. So irradiation, even though it doesn't change the temperature, the sterilization mechanism and the sterilization outcome are very similar. The difference being that we don't have chemical reactions associated with temperature. Maillard, caramelization, oxidation, those all get reduced in irradiation. Depending on the dose, we can do different things. So if you do a very low dose, we'll typically do that for grains and for sprouting vegetables, things like onions and potatoes. So it greatly reduces the rate of sprouting in different um, onions and tomatoes and stuff. So we can get delayed sprouting. The other thing that it's very, very good at is delaying mold. Strawberries are very routinely irradiated. In Canada, it's really strange because any food that's irradiated, and foods are irradiated in Canada, you have to put the radura symbol on it. It's law. Has anyone ever seen it? I've never seen it on a packaged food before, and irradiation happens here. There's no question that there's food that have been irradiated in other countries and then imported, and foods that have been irradiated in Canada, and that should have this symbol. I have no idea why it's not enforced. Okay, where are we for time? We've got 10 more minutes. All right. So now, we've talked about ways of eliminating bacteria from foods. One of the challenges that we have when we talk about food loss and food security is respiration of those vegetables, of meats, of any material that's biological in origin. The second you destroy that plant, you kill that plant, you harvest it, there are respiratory reactions that are happening that are detrimental to the quality of that product, right? Structures are changing. You leave, you have desiccation of that product. So if you have a celery stick and you leave it in your fridge too long, it becomes limp. If you have uh, a banana that sits too long on the counter, it overripens, it becomes mushy. So respiration is happening in all foods that are harvested. So until we can, either separate out that compound, so take corn, take its oil, take its starch, do whatever we're going to do to it, we need to slow down the microbial growth as much as possible. And the best way to do that is by limiting the formation or the growth of mesophiles. The vast majority of molds and bacteria fall within that mesophilic range. So refrigeration was developed to slow the rate of microbial growth, especially mesophiles, at the same time, it selects for the growth of psychotrophs, but again, those are typically spoilage microorganisms. Pseudomonas, that nice glossy color you get on your cold cut. Once we get below 10 degrees Celsius, all deteriorative re reactions pretty much stop, and all microbial growth stops. Doesn't kill them. They're still there. When the temperature warms up, they're going to become viable again. But during storage, during cold storage, there is no replication of that, micro, of that bacteria. There's also a slower rate of degradation associated with the three most important determinants of shelf life. It slows down the rate of oxygen mobility because you typically create an, an, a low oxygen environment. It's consumed when the fridge is closed. You reduce the exposure to light. It's a closed environment and you slow down the rate of chemical reactions. So respiration slows. The rate at which that food rots slows. So we can get a lot of preservation or an increased length in the shelf life of a food product by storing it at 4 or 5 degrees Celsius. Not all foods can do that. 
And a great example is the banana. The banana you cannot put in the refrigerator. Everyone knows this, right? You never, ever, ever... Does anyone ever store a banana in the fridge? Never. <laughs> never, 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 never. Have you ever noticed that when you store a banana in the fridge, it's not as sweet and it's got a weird kind of... That's what I like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really weird texture. If, you're, if, you, if you have bananas at home, take one, throw it in the fridge for about two days, and then taste it. it. Especially if it's refrigerated early on. Like if you take a yellow banana and put it in the fridge, I'm trying to find a way out for you, and you put that yellow banana in the fridge, you're, it's not going to be too bad because it's ripe, but if you put a green banana in the fridge, <laughs> it's disgusting. It's like this kind of sweet no it's not mushy but like like tactilely chewy yeah, like it, yeah. <laughs> and you like that yeah. oh <laughs> i am so i am really i i'm i i don't know if it's the right word is neophobic i have a really hard time with imperfections in food so i have a hard time eating produce because if i see a blemish the idea of eating a cold, staled banana, <laughs> uh, like I, it, it would be like putting a live cricket in your mouth. Like that, that, that's my, my, like it almost induces a gag reflex thinking about it. Ugh, yeah. No, not really. So what it actually does is it affects how ethylene binds to it. And ethylene is extremely, extremely important when we talk about respiration of produce. All, most fruits and vegetables ripen in response to ethylene. So when those bananas are green, what's the best thing you can do to ripen that bana those bananas? A paper bag is one. Yeah, what else? Someone, I think someone said it. Not in the oven. Put it with a ripe fruit or a peeled banana because the ethylene binds to different receptor sites and induces color changes, induces sweetness changes, and induces all kinds of flavor changes in the banana. Now, I want to just, we'll quickly talk about this and then we'll talk about the exam. The banana is absolutely a fina fa fascinating food. So first, all bananas, something you need to understand about bananas is they all undergo colonial reproduction. What does that mean? It means that every single plant is genetically identical to every single other plant. So when we talk about bananas, there's a, there's a couple thousand different natural cultivars of banana. Majority of them have big seeds in them and they're not what we call dessert bananas. So dessert bananas have that characteristic sweet banana flavor. Now, because the industry relies on colonial propagation. All plants are genetically identical, making them all susceptible to the same thing. So if there's a fungus or a mold that can attack one plant, it can attack every single plant that's on an industrial plantation in the world. And this happened in 1965. It wiped out bananas. Bananas no longer existed on an industrial scale in 1965. This was what was referred to as the gross Michelle apple. Or sorry, banana. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone in here ever had a gross Michelle? We saw them being grown down in Costa Rica last year. Did you? Yeah. So there was one small farm that was trying to grow gross Michelle. And did they let you taste them? No. Ah. Oh. So has anyone here ever eat runts or that banana flavored cough syrup? Do you know, well, don't think of the cough syrup part. Think of the banana flavor. It doesn't taste like the banana we eat today. It's so, it's so much better. That's the flavor of the cabin dish, uh, of the Gros Michel. That's gone. We can, because that fusarium bacteria or mold, fungus, has contaminated the industrial plantations, it can never be planted again. So we are stuck with the cabin dish. The crazy thing about it is, though, we have that, oh, We'll let him tell it, and then we'll talk about the exam. The one thing that never sticks around and is gone as fast as we can buy it is the wonderful, beautiful, noble banana.
Unfortunately for us, they may not be around forever. First, the good. Bananas are a healthy pack of nutrition and energy. They fit in your hand and give nice little cues when they're perfectly <coughs> ripe and are easy to peel and eat. Shocking statistic, the banana is Walmart's number one selling item. Not the potato chip, not Coca-Cola, not Fifty Shades of Grey, bananas. They appear to be so perfect for human consumption that Kirk Cameron attempted to use them to prove the existence of God. Of course, this banana was not created by God, or really even nature. Bananas, at least the ones that you see in the store, were created by people. Don't get me wrong, there are wild banana plants, lots of them. They're native to South and Southeast Asia, and there are dozens of species and thousands of varieties. They're just not the ones we eat. Some of those species, as you might suspect, have seeds. That's what fruits are. They're fleshy bodies containing seeds. So you might wonder, why have you never eaten a banana seed? Well, you have, kinda. In cultivated bananas, the seeds have pretty much stopped existing. If you look closely, you can see tiny black specks. Those are all that's left, and they're not fertile seeds. If you plant them, nothing grows. Today's bananas are sterile mutants. I'm not trying to be mean, that's just the truth. Once you were alive in the 1960s, hats off to all those older Sideshow viewers out there, every banana you have ever eaten was pretty much genetically identical. This is a Cavendish, a virtually seedless variety that we all eat today, but it wasn't always our banana of choice. Until the 1960s, everyone was eating the same banana, it was just a different banana, the Gros Michel. A bigger, sweeter fruit with thicker skin. You might notice that banana-flavored things don't really taste like bananas. Well, they do. They taste like the Gros Michel. The genetic monotony of the Gros Michel crop was its undoing. A fungicide-resistant pathogen called Panama disease began infecting the Gros Michel crop. By the time growers understood how vulnerable their crops were, the Gros Michel variety was all but extinct. The entire banana industry had to be retooled for the Cavendish. Since they're seedless, the only way to reproduce them is to transplant part of the plant's stem. And for the last 50 years, we've been good with the Cavendish, because it's more resistant to Panama disease. However, somewhat terrifyingly, a strain of Panama disease that affects the Cavendish strain that we all eat has been identified. A global monoculture of genetically <coughs> identical individuals is a beautiful sight to a pathogen. The fungus only has to figure out how to infect and destroy a single individual, and suddenly there's no diversity to stop it or even slow it down. That's led to a lot of scientists worrying about or even predicting. All right. Kind of cool, eh? Does anyone know, just before we talk about the exam, the other new industry in Canada that relies on clonal propagation? <laughs> <laughs> Marijuana industry, yeah. So cannabis is another plant that every single plant is a monoclonal of another. And why? Does anyone know why that is? Because there's certain strains that produce more favorable and they want to keep those clones in cultivation. That's exactly right. So if you are a pothead and you talk about the difference between an, an I can't say them, a stavia and an inc incida. <laughs> Wonder. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Girl, oh. <laughs> Hang out with him. <laughs> so so it's exactly right. Because C B D and THC are so different. They want to be utilized so, <laughs> sorry about that, so that you can grow a strain now that has no THC. So if you smoke it, you don't get high, but you still get the medicinal benefits associated with CBD and TH, sorry, CBD. It's a really fascinating area, which some people know a lot about. <laughs> yeah, I'll. It's funny because I, I, I knew nothing about the marijuana industry. All of a sudden I'm consulting in the industry all the time because there's so little known about how to put THC and CBD into edibles and how to increase their bioaccessibility. So if you eat a marijuana cookie, depending on how that is formulated, you can get not high at all with the same amount of THC as another cookie that's formulated differently that you can get really, really messed up on. So I try to understand the physics of the food and how it influences the THC to allow you to get high. I don't do it by actually experimenting on myself though. <laughs> All right, so the final, the midterm, and this goes for the final exam as well. So I've getting, been getting a lot, a lot of questions on what do I have to know? 
And I hate that question, and I get why you ask it, and I get the, the associations of anxiety with this exam, because it's going to be in a type of an exam that you haven't seen before. So when you get there, take a deep breath, it's all going to be fine if you came to class or watched the videos. If you didn't watch the videos, if you didn't, watch, didn't attend classes, don't expect to do super well. Those lecture notes that were given to you will probably get you a 60. If you, if you have no other information other than that little handful of information, other than that packet of facts, that facts is enough information to get 100% if you can put it into context to how we talked about it. So when you're reading those notes, what I want you to think about is the context in which we frame them. And I'm going to give you some examples of some questions that can get you thinking about how to study. So, I have such a, I hate writing the exam before I do the, these kind of things because every question that pops into my head is on the exam. So I'm like, oh, I can't say that. So I look like a fool standing up here, staring off into the sky. So, an example of a question. If you were hired by a company and they wanted you to design a food that would have a certain biological response. And I don't know what that biological response is going to be. Let's say it's, you want it to, you want it to be more satiating. How would you do that? What would you do? How would you formulate it? How would you process it? How many different answers are there? A ton. So you could talk about particle size, right? You could talk about if it's in a liquid smoothie form or a solid food form. You could talk about a degree of processing. So have we taken all of it and put it as starch in a food? You could talk about uh, changing the biophysics or changing the chemistry of how it breaks down to slow the allele break. You could talk about, I don't know, there's, there's hundreds of different examples of how you could talk about it. There is no one correct answer on this exam. It is opinion and logic. So what I want to see is, can you take a question that you've never seen before, can you think of it within the context of how we've discussed course content, and apply that information to that problem? Again, that problem will not be something we've discussed in class. So you have to think on your feet. You can't memorize a whole bunch of facts and then think you're going to do well. It's not, it's not enough. It also means you don't have to memorize that the difference in growth temperatures to favor streptococcus versus lactobacillus is 43.3. I don't care if you know that, because if you don't, in 30 seconds in the real world, you can go on Google and find it. What I need you to be able to do, and what you need to be able to do in the reality of the situation when you graduate, is you need to be able to apply what knowledge you have, Hopefully by coming to class, by listening, not by memorizing, by getting the big picture of what we're talking about. So when we talk about lipolysis, do I care if you know that the aspartic, the aspartic histidine lysine triad is responsible for a shift in electrons that allows for hydrogen to be donated? No, I don't care. It's irrelevant. It can be, it can be looked up in a couple of seconds. Do I care that you understand where lipase is being produced and where foods are being digested, how that food is breaking down, how your body is responding to that food. Of course, that's what matters, right? Big pictures. I have 10 questions. If I've spent 30 seconds on a slide, I'm not going to base a question on it, right? If I spent 15 minutes talking about D and Z values, talking about organic acids, chances are that's a good indicator that they're going to be on there, right? So think about that while you're studying. That's your biggest hint. If, you're, if you haven't watched the videos yet, I know there's a lot more people in here today than are typically here. For those who haven't come to class, watch the videos. Watch the videos and read the notes as you're going and make sure you understand the context of that note. Because on its own, it's an irrelevant fact that you're going to have a very difficult time applying to a problem. If you know everything there, that's all you're going to need to answer the questions if you can frame them and make an argument in a question. So the, the questions are opinions. You won't be right or wrong irrespective of if your opinion is the same or disagrees with me. As long as you have three points to back it up.
three facts from class that support your argument. And if you can support your argument with three facts that are correct, full marks. If you create an argument that has two correct facts and a third fact which is, let's say, wrong or not applicable, then you'll get four to, four to six. If you're completely off topic and you don't know, uh, this, I, there's no question on Maillard reaction, but if, you, if there's a question on Maillard reaction and you don't know what Maillard reaction is, you're going to get zero. Like if you start talking about oxidation of lipids, when you're, the question is on um, Maillard reaction, you're just so off topic that I can't find marks to give you. Make sense? It depends how, that's where it gets tricky. And so when we mark, we mark all in a room together. And that's typically a question that will then come to me. And it depends. It, there's no yes or no answer to that. Um, if it really, if, it, if it's just, you're throwing in a fact because it's clear you, need, you, you only have two out of three and you have no third one. And you're just throwing a fact that you know that's completely unrelated to the course to try to finish your argument, no. If it builds in your story and it's, it, it's an essential part of your argument, probably. Um, so I, I don't want to say yes or no in that case. It's a case-by-case -case basis. Key is to make an opinion, to have three quality things that you can look at and say, I'd get two marks for that, I can get two marks for that, and I can get two marks for that. It's the easiest way to write the exam. So each question is worth six marks. It really doesn't matter if it's worth six or 60. It's each question is worth one tenth of the exam. All questions are weighted equally. Um, what, if, what if it's a response uh, derived from what you read in those articles that you gave us? And again, it really, it really comes to what it is and how it relates to the question. So if, if, if it's essential to answering your question, absolutely, you're fine. If it's if it's kind of a side note that really doesn't answer the question, that doesn't aid, aid in answering the question, probably not. No, no, no. I know what comes from the class and what doesn't. Yeah, that's fine. Any other questions on the exam? Yeah. Yeah. There's eight topics there. Yeah. There's two to questions on one topic. Right. That's, so, so that doesn't mean that you couldn't take a fact from another slide and apply it. What it means is that's going to be the focus of, the, of those questions. If you're confident speaking about the Western diet, if you're confident on speaking on each of those eight parameters, you'll do fine on the exam. If, if you've been to class, if you haven't been to class, really honestly, if you don't watch the videos, you're not going to do well. That's just the reality of it. You can't expect to get 12 pages of paper and expect to ace the exam. You'll pass, likely. You'll get a 60, maybe a 50, but you'll pass. You know, if you didn't come to class, that's a pretty good thing to have done. So the idea of it is to, you have to be able to sit there and say, why were we talking about this? Why is it important? How does it relate? Right? I want to see if you can take those little bits of information and apply them to completely new problems. Don't think you're going to get 100% on the exam. I don't like giving 100%. Usually one or two people will get it. Lots of people will get A's. Tons of people will get A's. Usually, the, usually in a class like this, it's a very bimodal distribution. You've got your students who are always asking questions, are always engaging, who are partaking. You know, they're, they're, you've got an, a, a mode distribution around 80 to 85. And then you've got people who are here just to be here. They're gonna, there's going to be a bimodal distribution around 60. It always happens. You know, you don't, very rarely in university do we see a nice monomodal distribution. That's why bell curving should never be done in a university. It's because we don't have monomodal distributions typically. In a class this size, we might. One thing I'm going to ask you to do on the exam is on the last page on the back, tell me if you wrote the, that if you came to all the, most of the classes. I know not everyone comes to every class and I don't care. If you didn't come to classes, I don't care. What I want to know is I want to be able to show if you were, if, if you didn't come to class, didn't watch videos, if you watched the videos but didn't come to class, and if you came to class, and if you came to class and watched videos. And I, what I want to, the only reason I want to do it is I want to see if there's an effect across those four groups for the GPA. This way I can show it to you when you're, when you're, when you come back after the exam, and it may be an argument to, 
to come to class, but it could very well be an argument that the mean of people who don't come to class and watch videos is the exact same as the mean of people who come to class. I'm just curious. I'm not going to use it to check. I'm going to put it on the back of the last page. I'm not going to associate it with your name. So I'm not going to mark it and then look and be like, oh, they didn't come to class, minus three, minus three. I'm not going to do that. I, you know, I, I, I don't care if you come to class. I do. I like seeing you here. But at the end of the day, it's your decision. So. But please answer it honestly, because it'll affect the distribution. Yeah. Oh, they're all on, so YouTube. Uh, you of Guelph, Food Prof, all one word. They're all there. Um, that 